coming up on Network Africa. South Africa begins a week of mourning for Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Scaled down funeral plans due to COVID restrictions. Plus, Somalia's president suspends prime minister amid election dispute. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Tenyo Lash Shoboale. South Africa started a week of mourning to honor anti-apartheid icon and Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who died in a Cape Town nursing home on Sunday at the age of 90. Bells rang at midday from the city St. George's Anglican Cathedral, where the Nobel laureate had urged South Africans of all races to work together against apartheid. They will toll for 10 minutes at noon for five days. Meanwhile, people laid flowers at the cathedral in front of Tutu's home in Cape Town's Minolton area and in front of his former home in Soweto, Johannesburg. The Archbishop will lie in state for two days before an official state funeral on January the 1st in Cape Town. At 10 a.m. on Saturday, New Year's Day, the funeral will take place here, and it is here where his ashes will also be interred. But expect announcements in the next day or two from other churches and institutions of state and non-governmental organizations about their events. Please attend services in your local communities and parishes. Our list of possible attendees at the funeral run to 400 or 500 names and more than 100 clergy. But COVID regulations restrict attendance at funerals to a maximum of 100, and we must respect that. Only a fraction of those who want to be there can be accommodated in the cathedral. So please don't get into a bus to Cape Town. <laughs> we have arranged those cathedrals and the local parishes so that we uh, cater for your needs. Well, it was an eventful weekend with the death of South Africa's Archbishop Desmond Tutu and the suicide bomb attack at a restaurant in the Democratic Republic of Congo on Christmas Day. Let's take a look at the summary of weekend stories. It is with great sadness that I have to announce that our dearly beloved Archbishop Emeritus of Cape Town and the 1984 Nobel Peace Laureate Desmond Mpila Tutu died a short while ago at the age of 90. South Africa's Anglican Archbishop of Cape Town, Thabo Mokpoba, announced on Sunday the death of anti-apartheid campaigner Archbishop Desmond Tutu at the age of 90. Tutu was diagnosed with prostate cancer in the late 1990s and in recent years, he was hospitalized on several occasions to treat infections associated with his cancer treatment. <laughs> Tr 
tributes poured in from leaders around the world for the Nobel Peace Prize laureate and veteran of South Africa's struggle against apartheid, who was revered as his nation's conscience by both black and white. He was friend. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa described him as a hero and one of the nation's finest patriots. Archbishop Desmond Tutu was one of our nation's finest patriots. He was a man of unwavering courage, of principled conviction, and whose life was spent in the service of others. He in many ways embodied the essence of our humanity. Knowing he had been ill for some time now, does very little to lessen the blow that has been dealt to South Africa this very sad day. In other news, a suicide bomber struck a restaurant in the city of Beni in eastern Congo on Saturday, killing at least five people as well as himself. The attack marks the latest violence in a region where Congolese and Ugandan forces have launched a campaign against suspected Islamists from the Allied Democratic Forces, a group aligned with the Islamic State. Protesters opposed to military rule on Saturday reached the vicinity of the presidential palace in the capital of Khartoum for the second time in a week, despite heavy tear gas and a communications blackout. Internet services were disrupted in the capital, Khartoum, and locals were unable to make or receive domestic calls while soldiers and rapid support forces blocked roads leading to bridges linking Khartoum and Omdurman. Well, let's get some more updates on South Africa now. We're hearing that Cape Town sites have been lit up in purple to mark the passing of Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Cape Town City Hall and the Table Mountain, which rises above the city, will be illuminated every night this week in purple, the colour of Tutu's clerical robes. An appropriate uh, visual symbol to memorialize and celebrate the life of this remarkable Cape Tonian, this remarkable human being, Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu. We really had to go with the color that was so synonymous with him, with his tenure as Archbishop, and that is obviously purple. And so we decided to light up the city hall uh, in that color purple, the Table Mountain, uh, and St. George's Cathedral around the corner from here. In celebration of his life and the hope is that when this these images of these iconic Cape Town sites go around the world bathed in the light of uh, in this purple light that it will be a helpful reminder to everyone around the world to remember and celebrate this truly great Cape Tonian and human well, our South Africa Bureau Chief Betty Dibia joins us now for more. Betty, South Africans are in mourning. We've heard bells will toll for 10 minutes at noon for five days, and also the lights at Cape Town have been lit to purple. How else are South Africans paying tribute? Well, you have the private citizens going to his old home, uh, that's in uh, Soweto, where we were yesterday. Um, his home has been cordoned off in Cape Town, where his uh, wife, um, Madame Lear, and the family, they're, they're all, the president just left the place now, where he addressed the people, saying that even if we're mourning, uh, it's also time to celebrate a gigantic life, well lived, um, uh, in, in support of people, the downtrodden, and, and a happy life as well, uh, even as he fought for the people. So um, people are different groups that he belonged to. He was very uh, in support of young people, the youths and uh, children. He was in support of, of mental health issues, so many things. So, so many groupings have events to, to um, honor him. Uh, the one I know just recently released now is the Cape Town, uh, no, uh, Johannesburg, Anglican Church of Johannesburg. 
tomorrow they'll be giving details of things that they'll be doing. People are laying flowers in relevant places. You saw a, a clip of the St. George's Cathedral um, where um, Archbishop Tabo Mahabo was speaking. People are laying flowers in his honor. Uh, flags will also fly at half mast, according to the president. We don't know when. Um, maybe that has already started happening because how he announced it, then we didn't have the date of the funeral service. He said the, the days leading up to the funeral uh, of the late um, Archbishop Emeritus. So by seven, be, because of COVID restrictions, only about 100 people are allowed to attend funerals. 7 a.m. on Friday, people will be allowed to come into St. George's Cathedral, where you'll be lying in state to honor him. Um, that that's anybody can do that because you're not allowed to sit down. You just come pay your respects and you go out to give more people uh, space to do so. So these are some of the things. Um, but we know that the major funeral service will be on Saturday, um, the first of January. Well, bearing in, bearing with the COVID restrictions in place and bearing in mind how much the Archbishop uh, was loved, are, are people likely to stay away? People will have to stay away. Um, the, the authorities will ensure that, remember, we're still dealing with the fourth wave of uh, COVID-19 in the country where you're seeing thousands of numbers. I know it's fluctuating. We went from 16,000 or 15,000 the day before. Yesterday we had 5,000 plus and nobody knows uh, what it's gonna be for today. So um, you have the major, probably the president. Um, we know that the ANC will be represented by uh, the foreign minister, Naledi Pando, to visit the, the Desmond Tutu home, just like the president just did. Um, but Regarding the church, they will have to ensure that um, the, the numbers are, that's what the president had announced earlier going into this fourth wave. So I'm sure that they will ensure that it's done. But the service will be uh, shown all over the world, actually, and all the dioceses, um, all the churches to ensure that people get to see what's going on. I, I understand there will be a pop-up channel as well, if it's not already on, for people to, to witness uh, the events, but I know that Friday from 7 a.m., people will be allowed to go into St. George's Cathedral to pay their respects and leave. All right, then, Betty, thank you so much for the update. Thank you very much. Well, also joining leaders across the world to mourn the late Archbishop, Nigeria's former president, Olusegun Obasanjo, says his death is a great loss for South Africa and the African continent. In an exclusive interview, Chief Obasanjo describes him as a humanist and a moral compass who fought against apartheid in South Africa. The former president says he would be missed by all, especially by him, as he was highly instrumental to his becoming the president of Nigeria, after he was released from prison. I remain uh, eternally grateful to him. When I came out of prison and I had this uh, decision to make, pressure was mounting on me to come and contest the presidency of Nigeria. Apart from consulting with people in Nigeria, there were two South Africans I consulted, Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela. And Nelson Mandela said to me, when, when I told him, I said, look, I came out of prison, this pressure was mounting. He said, follow your uh, intuition. I said, thank you, Madiba. Desmond Tutu, when Desmond Tutu listened to me, he said, hmm, my brother, what you are saying is that your country wants you to serve, and you are saying you have served before and you went to prison, and you don't want to serve again. I said, no, 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 that's not quite what I'm saying. He said, say it again. I repeated myself, and he said, well, the same story I've got. And my brother, go back home and serve your people. There are no two ways about it. I will say this to my brothers and sisters in South Africa, I will uh, heartfelt condolence. We have lost 
a great South African, a great African, a great uh, man of black race, a great uh, uh, a, Greek, a great Christian, and as you rightly put it, a great moral compass. We'll have more on the death of the Archbishop when we return after the break. Plus, ship captain sentenced to 20 months in jail over Mauritius oil spill. More details in a moment. Please stay with us. Thanks for staying with us. More reactions from Nigeria on the death of the Archbishop, now chairman of the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, NDLEA, Brigadier General Mohamed Bubamara, has described the late South African Archbishop Desmond Tutu as a titanic figure of non-violent struggle, human rights and evangelism. Mawa, who is a former Nigerian High Commissioner to South Africa, in a statement states that he would be remembered for his stand against apartheid in his country through non-violent means similar to Gandhi's approach in India. Well, Archbishop Desmond Tutu was an uncompromising foe of apartheid in South Africa, working tirelessly and peacefully for its downfall. In 1984, the South African cleric and activist won the Nobel Peace Prize. A decade later, he witnessed the end of that regime and chaired a Truth and Reconciliation Commission set up to unearth atrocities committed during those dark days. Here's more on his life and times. Archbishop Desmond Tutu was born in October 1931 and ordained an Anglican priest in 1961. He was thrust into the limelight in 1978 when he was appointed Secretary General of the South African Council of Churches. Talking and traveling tirelessly throughout the 1980s, he forced the West to focus on the suffering of South Africa's black majority under white rule. Apartheid is as evil, as immoral, as unchristian in my view, as Nazism. And in my view, the Reagan administration's support and collaboration with it is equally immoral, evil, and totally unchristian without remainder. He was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1984 for his nonviolent campaign to win racial equality for his people. In 1986, he became the first black head of the Anglican Church in South Africa when he was enthroned as the Archbishop of Cape Town, a position he retained for 10 years. When black nationalist leader Nelson Mandela was released from his 27-year imprisonment in 1990, he stayed with his longtime friend Desmond Tutu on his first night of freedom and gave his first news conference in the grounds of Tutu's official residence. <laughs> Four years later, an ecstatic Desmond Tutu was able to vote for the first time in South Africa's historic all-race elections. What hopes he may have had of a gentle retirement faded when President Mandela asked Tutu to head the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, charged with the delicate task of probing political crime committed during the apartheid era. In spite of failing health and undergoing treatment for potentially terminal cancer, he continued in his role as the nation's moral guardian. He regularly criticized the ruling African National Congress and was not averse to attacking Mandela's successors, Thabo Mbeki and Jacob Zuma. And thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your love, Tata Tutu. Thank you. Thank Archbishop Tutu, who retired from most public duties in October 2010, is still seen as a voice of integrity. The Arch, as he is affectionately known, will be remembered as one of the leading lights of the struggle against the apartheid, who was not afraid to condemn injustice wherever he saw it. To other stories now, Somalia's President Mohamed Abdullahi Mohamed says he has suspended Prime Minister Hussein Robles, sparking accusations of an indirect coup. The move comes amid a protracted feud that has seen both leaders trade allegations over the holding of 
parliamentary holding up of parliamentary elections. The office of the president in a statement accused Roble of interfering with an investigation into a land grabbing case. In response, Roble's office called the statement outrageous, saying on the attempt to militarily take over the office of the prime minister was in breach of the law. Mr. Robley says he remains fully committed to fulfilling his national responsibility to conduct an acceptable electoral process that culminates in a peaceful transition of power. A court in Mauritius has handed a 20-month jail sentence to the captain and first mate of a freighter that crashed into a coral reef last year, causing the region's worst environmental disaster. Magistrate Ida Rambarun says the court had taken into consideration the fact that both defendants pleaded guilty and apologized. The MV Wakashio, a Japanese-owned vessel, ran aground in July 2020, spilling toxic fuel into to the pristine waters of Mauritius, quoting mangroves, corals, and other fragile ecosystems. The vessel's captain, who was convicted by a court in the capital, Port Louis, last week admitted drinking during an onboard party. A young Nigerian living in Ibadan oil state has built a sports car using locally accessible materials. Michael Olajide is a plant science graduate from the Olabisi Novanjo University, uh, Guiwoye Ogun State, uh, wishes to pursue a career in mechanical engineering. He started building the car in his final year of university and it took him three years to complete. Take a look. In the ancient city of Ibado, Oyo State is where a 29-year-old Nigerian graduate brings his childhood dream to life by building a vehicle for himself. My name is Ibito Yolajide Michael. I studied plant science, but now I'm making a car. When I was young, I said to myself, the first car I'm going to use would be made by me. It took Michael three years to finish this project from 2017 to 2020. When he started building, he says he had no idea what to do, and so he sought help. I came to meet uh, a welder to tell him maybe he can be able to help me make a car just because I don't have the experience of me welding metals together. So that day I told him if he can teach me how to make use of tongue, which they use in welding metals together, and he started teaching me, and that day I got it. And that will be the very first day I'll start welding metals together. Michael says most of the materials he used to build the car were sourced locally, as he did not have the necessary funds to support it. I sought for ions around my place. And the melters which I use for the tube chassis, that is the skeleton, like a bone of the car. So after I sought for engine, wheels, gear, and everything, the wiring. And after that, I started the covering. And the covering, I use uh, fiberglass and with some chemicals. So that is the reason you see it harder. The name of my car is uh, Michael 241 and it's a sports car. Um, what actually brought up the name is, my nickname is Michael, and my date of birth is 24 January. Although Michael Olajide Bitoye has brought this childhood dream to life without any formal education or training in the mechanical field, he still wishes to study his dream course, which is mechanical engineering. 
<laughs> Amazing stuff. Well, that's the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Tenny Olash, Shibu Ali. Bye for now.